Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, guys. Phil, uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to uh, do just a quick talk here. On, it's an overview. It's basically in three parts. One, I'm going to talk a little bit about catfish farming as, as it goes on in the western part of the state. Most of our fee fishing industries, which is the second part that I'm going to speak about, is actually uh, in the center in the eastern part of the state. We don't have a lot of fee fishing operations uh, in western Kentucky, maybe a few, but not many. Um, and finally, uh, a little bit about pond and lake management. These are mostly small private ponds that I work with. And we, we have those across the state. We always get lots of, lots of questions about pond and lake management. So I thought I would throw some of that in there to kind of give you an idea of the spectrum of, of things we work with. I'm gonna start out first uh, with Kentucky catfish production. We, uh, we have just a very small industry, a handful of people involved in, in the state here uh, in West Kentucky. And uh, actually we've had a few that are, one farm is up for sale and we've got a couple others that may exit the industry uh, in the next year or two. So we're kind of down, kind of down in our numbers as well. But uh, the, the first thing that uh, I would su suggest you do uh, with any venture in agriculture or, or just what, uh, whatever uh, endeavor you're in is to find a market where you can sell your fish. It's really important. We get a lot of people that are very excited about the prospect of, of buying, of growing fish, but they're not all that excited about selling them. And this leads to some problems. So uh, make sure you get your markets identified first. And it's probably good to have a, a plan B and C in case the, your, uh, your main marketing uh, option uh, doesn't work out. But the things we want to look at when we establish a fish farming operation, and I'm talking about catfish here, but it's also appropriate for largemouth bass, bait minnows, hybrid striped bass, other species as well. Out here we mostly have catfish farms uh, to date. But anyway, we're looking for uh, pond sites with the proper soil types. We need heavy clay soils, subsoils. Obviously, we need some kind of water supply uh, or watershed to fill the ponds. We need abundant enough water to take care of that. And commercial production ponds, depending on what you're growing, probably start somewhere around a half acre on up to uh, anywhere from one acre to five, maybe even 10 acres. 10 acres would be a big production pond for us here in state, but other states uh, have those and ones that are even bigger. Uh, proper, proper permitting, uh, keeping this operation legal is important. The permitting requirements are not great in Kentucky, but they do exist. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife has, uh, handles the permitting and the regulation for aquaculture uh, in the state. So uh, that's a, an important thing to, uh, to uh, sign up for and get out of the way. Uh, make sure your operation is legal. Uh, our, our ponds are obviously all earth and construction for the most part anyway, and uh, you want a reputable excavator after you've picked a good site with good soils and adequate water uh, to, uh, to fill the ponds. So you're, you're wanting to, you want to build uh, good ponds, and we'll talk a little bit about this stuff uh, here in the next few slides. Cost of, is real uh, dependent on, on site. No two sites are the same. No two plots of the land are the same. So out here, uh, pond construction costs can be vary anywhere from $2,000 to an acre on up to $7,000 per acre or more. And right now we're down in our numbers a little bit. We probably have less than 100 acres of water in production uh, right now in the state. We've got some ponds up that are old enough to be renovated. We've got a few ponds out of uh, production right now. And we have, as I've mentioned, a couple uh, producers that are at least considering exit, exiting the industry if they've not done so already. So our markets, biggest, biggest thing you want to address is where are you going to sell your fish? Uh, we produce lots and lots of fish, as you'll see, a thousand pounds, thousands of pounds per acre, and you've got to have somewhere to go with them. Uh, the vast majority of catfish in the southeastern states are sold uh, to processing plants. They're all live to processing plants. And then uh, process there. Uh, we mostly address uh, fee fishing markets here, but there are also pond stocking markets uh, for recreational ponds, and uh, and some uh, in larger towns and cities. Uh, there there can be some markets uh, for various ethnic groups that like to buy live fish. Uh, this is a 
a time-honored tradition in, in uh, large fish-eating cultures around the world where there's no argument about freshness if the fish is flopping around and has a good clear eye looking back at you. You can't uh, argue whether the fish is fresh or not. So believe it or not, fish were sold that way in this country uh, for many years uh, before we started uh, buying and selling a processed product. Uh, most of our fish in state are sold to fee fishing operations. Uh, there are quite a few of those operations in eastern Kentucky and central Kentucky in particular. Um, fee fishing is basically the, the concept of uh, fishing a fairly small pond in most cases that's heavily stocked with fish. Catfish are the fish of choice generally speaking because they're fairly inexpensive and also there's a ready uh, supply of them. The, uh, Fee fishing market, at least out here, they'll start selling fish to fee fishing ponds pro probably in February and maybe go into October depending on the season. So the, the season can be fairly long, but the bulk of it is probably, let's say, April through uh, July, that time, time frame. Uh, this is a niche market. And one of the nice things about fee fishing is we uh, avoid the uh, processing constraints and headaches. Uh, and we also get, usually get a slightly higher. Um, price for our fish per pound than you would be if you sold them to a large commercial processor, let's say in uh, Mississippi or Arkansas or over in Alabama. We don't have any commercial processing um, operations, large-scale ones anyway, here in Kentucky right now. So what do we need to do this? Well, I mentioned water source. Uh, we've got a lot of groundwater out here. Uh, I'm out in the Jackson Purchase area of Kentucky, the far western point of the uh, of Kentucky and uh, it's pretty flat out here we have almost no rocks in our soil just little pebbles and uh, we have pretty high water table so we take advantage of the uh, the water and we'll pump anywhere from 20 to 15 gallons per minute per acre is ideal actually for catfish ponds and the, this well that you're looking at in this picture can pump literally hundreds of gallons of water I think that We'll handle about 600 gallons per minute. Uh, and this particular farm has now has about 45 acres worth of ponds. And those ponds are somewhere between four and five acres each. I think they have about 10 of them. So, um, so groundwater is actually ideal for aquaculture if you can use it, if you have ready, ready access to it. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't contain pathogens and it's, it's uh, generally pretty pure and, and cool. But you want to test all this stuff out before you dig one of these big wells. Surface water, many places, many states use these. The Alabama catfish industry is very dependent on surface water, and they catch it from watershed sources and river streams. This water needs to be filtered just because there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, pathogens, things, small fish, insects, things that you don't necessarily want to pump into your pond. So surface water is an option but it, um, it can be a bit iffy and it should be filtered out if at all possible. Uh, basically running it through a sieve or what we would call a saran sock, uh, which is basically a, a very fine mesh net sock that the water goes through to try to keep out as many unwanted organisms as possible. The third option is watershed or runoff. Runoff is nice, but uh, and right now I don't, can't speak for the rest of the state, but we, we have nightly torrential thunderstorms out here. So we have plenty of water out here right now, but generally speaking, August, September, October, get pretty dry. And uh, the watershed sources are just not there when you need them the most when the temperatures outside have reached the warmest. So our pond sizes generally average about five surface acres out here in Kentucky. We have levee style ponds, which basically are just a cut and filled shallow pond. Uh, they might be five or six feet deep uh, on average, uh, not much more than that. And these things have almost no watershed. On the other side of things, we have watershed ponds or hill ponds that catch a lot of rainwater, have a watershed, and that the, the runoff fills the, bond, the pond basin in a watershed or runoff pond. And you can have hybrid, hybrids of these, partial levee, partial watershed ponds, and on and on it goes. Uh, it depends entirely on the source of your water and also on the uh, topography and the, the site specific aspects of, of your property. You can see here in the foreground of this picture, a tractor pulled one of our harvest seines. 
that thing hanging back is a greater sock and all the fish are funneled down from the net into that sock and the fish are graded out through it and that's how they're harvested. I'll show you some pictures of that here in a minute. Uh, construction, very expensive. This is a land intensive type of operation. Uh, so that's one of the downsides of this type of aquaculture is it takes a lot of land. In this takes, case, it takes a fair amount of flat land. Um, we line the ponds basically with a compacted clay liner. We're looking at about 20 to 30% clay content as a minimum in the soils. We really wanna get a good liner in there to hold, to hold uh, the water. Uh, you need full pond access around the ponds for harvesting. Uh, and feeding, and road access, of course, to get trucks in and out to haul the fish away is, is critical and bring feed in and these sorts of things. And also electricity, a lot of our farms just have single pay, phase power, but uh, three phase is actually best if you can do it. And we also recommend that incorporating a drain structure into the pond is, is really a good tool because these ponds probably need to be renovated somewhere between every 10 and 20 years after construction to get some of the silt and waste out of them. They really need to be re dried out, reconfigured, and reworked from the inside out so that they're easier to harvest. Our ponds are built shallow. Uh, like I said, probably no more than eight feet deep uh, to get the fish out and also to help maintain water quality. But it's really critical to be able to get your fish out of your pond because these are thousands of pounds of fish and, and you really want to be able to get them out in a, a reasonably efficient manner. Uh, feeding catfish, feeding, feeding is probably your biggest operating cost. Somewhere around, uh, it could be as high as 50%. Um, we feed, the good thing about catfish is they feed a relatively, the adults are fed a relatively uh, low protein, a 28% protein diet. It's an extruded pellet that floats. And uh, this, this particular, Diet contains almost no fish meal. This may be a little acted as, added as an attractant, but uh, the smaller fish require higher protein, probably somewhere around 35, 36%, but as they get older, their protein needs go down. And uh, the feed, especially for an aquaculture feed, is, uh, is fairly affordable. Uh, the feeding rates, depending on the size of the fish, uh, maybe one to three percent for big fish and ten percent of body weight for small fish. And generally these large ponds are fed a floating feed and, and whatever the fish will consume in about 20 to 30 minutes. And typically they're fed every day, at least during the growing season. Since we're throwing all this feed into the pond, uh, we, we run into aeration problems pretty quickly. Feeding rates probably for our commercial ponds go somewhere between 50 and 130 pounds of feed per acre per day. So that's a lot of feed. And the aeration capacity can be all over the map, but for argument's sake, we'll say one to five horsepower per acre. And what you see here is a, is a large paddle wheel. Uh, it's probably a 10 horsepower unit. Uh, they come in 15s, at least maybe 20s. Uh, and so there, there can be one or two of these per pond. And normally we'll run these at night. Uh, night and during rainy, cloudy days during the summer to make sure the aeration uh, is adequate in the water and there's enough dissolved oxygen in there in the pond so the fish don't, don't suffocate. Basically what we're doing is we're adding enough feed to these, these uh, ponds to where they produce a lot of algae and it's a very high biological oxygen demand. So without these aerators, we wouldn't be able to, need to feed nearly at the rate we are or produce as many fish. Again, a paddle wheel aerator. Here's a closer picture of one floating on pontoons. Uh, you can see kind of the, the, the ponds are in a row there, rectangular pond, uh, again, to help ease, ease harvest. Drag the net down one side and, of the pond and then on the other side of the pond, have two tractors basically dragging a net between them, uh, the length of the pond and you round up the fish at the end. So, um, Aeration, as I said, is, is nightly. Uh, we use this, uh, we want to turn this on particularly. Dissolved oxygen gets below three milligrams per liter. At, once you get fish, uh, oxygen levels lower than this, the fish can actually uh, get sick and or suffocate. So uh, we really want to keep those dissolved oxygen levels up, probably no lower than two and 
uh, three milligrams per liter and above is ideal. So the aeration is just used to force oxygen into the pond and the fish will congregate around that aerator until the oxygen levels are restored in the pond um, during daylight hours. Because what the, uh, the algae will, the algae will basically take in oxygen all night long but it will produce it in the daytime. So really aeration during the night, night hours is the most important. This is due to photosynthetic activity. So just an example, excuse me, just an example of production. This would be kind of a, a generic uh, fish production scenario. We'd stock fish in about 5,000 fingerlings per acre. Generally they go into the pond at about six inches. We have all this different sizes of fish in the pond at one time. The net is run through there and it culls off the bigger fish, probably those that are about a pound, pound and a half, uh, or maybe even two pounds and up. Those are the fish we want for harvest. The little ones just pass through the net and they, uh, they're captured at another time. Annual yields, we'll talk about 5,000 pounds per acre in a, in a ballpark sort of manner. So a five acre pond would produce roughly 25,000 pounds in the season. Mortality, it's anybody's guess. There's a lot going on out there. Uh, maybe 10% if you have a bad disease problems, uh, a lot of predation, it can be much higher. Food conversion on the feed, because we have different size fish in the pond, we, we get into that where it's, it's a little bit lower than we'd like, but roughly it's a three to one three pounds of feed to one pound of fish conversion. Maximum feed rate, as I mentioned before, roughly 130 pounds per acre per day. That's really pushing. And again, I mentioned uh, we, use, we feed mostly a 28% a 20, uh, feed protein. So some, cha count, some challenges, excuse me, uh, from the catfish industry standpoint are, uh, one of the ones we've run into out here is our farms tend a lot of our small farms in particular were too small to justify the cost of harvest equipment. This usually consists of a harvest seine, which can be anywhere from seven to 500, 700 to 1,000 feet long, a reel to store it on, uh, tractors to pull the seine down the levees, and uh, also usually we buy an old used boom truck somewhere to help lift the uh, fish up out of the pond. And you can see one of those in the picture there on the left um, doing just that. So uh, feed costs are real expensive still. Uh, our feed comes from uh, the Mississippi Delta where it's milled, uh, probably somewhere around the 350 ton, dollar a ton mark. And to get it all the way up here to West Kentucky, it costs us another 50 to $60 a ton just for shipping. And the east side of, um, on the east side of the state, you would probably get your feed in that and some and fingerlings from uh, um, from Alabama. Uh, uh, some of the other challenges: weak economy and affects food and uh, restaurant sales. We've we've all seen plenty of that here recently. That's for sure. And domestic competition from foreign catfish products has been an issue in other fish products, including competition from other less expensive protein sources such as as uh, pork um, and poultry. So these are some of the challenges we face in, in the industry today. Now some things to consider when you're catfish farm, considering catfish farming, is land costs and availability. This is, as I mentioned, a land intensive practice. That's one of its downside. There are fixed construction costs for wells and ponds. The ponds probably need to be updated or, or renovated every 10 to 12 years. And we also have some issues of keeping track of fish in inventories because we have all different size of, sizes of fish in the pond. And yes, there is some cannibalism in there. Uh, how much is uh, anybody's guess, but we try to stock fish that are six to seven inches long on the small end to try to minimize that cannibalism. Uh, because the ponds are outside, they're subject to all kinds of predation and pathogens, and there are high input costs. As in any other kind of farming, you've got weather issues, uh, temperature, water quality. Basically, when you fish farm, you're learning how to ma manage and or live with algal blooms. Algal blooms run the show. The fish are almost the sideshow out, out there. You're trying to keep the algae happy so that the oxygen doesn't crash in your ponds and uh, kill your fish. 
fish. So that's, uh, that's one of the challenging aspects of it. And there's a lot of night work during the uh, hot weather, checking, running aerators and this sort of thing during the summer. Uh, it's, it's hard for fish farmers to get much sleep during the warm months. And we have fluctuating market prices and a seasonal market here in Kentucky, at least as far as the, uh, as far as the uh, uh, live catfish industry goes, selling to fee fishing operations. So we'll use that as kind of a segue into uh, how Kentucky fee, oper fee fishing operations work. Uh, it's a fairly simple concept. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, you're basically uh, stocking a bunch of fish into a relatively small ponds and, and uh, charging people to come in and fish them out. Uh, it's a relatively inexpensive activity uh, and it can, provide a greater potential for catching fish just because there's so many fish stocked into the pond. Uh, customers can fish from a pond bank, which is nice. Uh, you don't need a boat or a lot of fancy equipment to do this. Um, and also, uh, if, a, if a operation is uh, permitted in the state of Kentucky at any, any rate, you can uh, fish without a, a state fishing license here that they are exempt from uh, the requirement of the uh, state fishing license if the particular operation is permitted through the uh, uh, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. And there may be some other entertainment opportunities available. Well, I've seen fee fishing operations, pay lakes that have games and other stuff going on for people that may either be bored with fishing or want to do something else. So it can be a relatively inexpensive uh, day fishing if you uh, if you've ever spent some time out on the big lakes chasing uh, fish around, you know that uh, $20 or so may not be too bad to fish in a small pond and actually have a better chance of catching something. Again, is there a market for fee fishing? Another good question. Uh, particularly in the eastern and, and northern Kentucky, there can be a lot of operations, a lot of competition. Some of our operations are, are quite, quite rural in location. So uh, almost all the advertising I've experienced has been done by word of mouth. So people have a good, good experience. They tend to tell their friends and neighbors and, uh, and that's how word spreads and that, that builds up a customer report. Uh, sometimes you will, you, you will wonder about adequate populations. You wanna be near a, a fairly decent sized town if you can. But I've seen plenty of these operations that have succeeded uh, in, in pretty remote areas. So it really comes down to how they are run and how they're managed. We'll talk a little bit about that. And also seasonality. Like I said, most of it will go on maybe depending where you are in the state from March, probably more likely April. And by Labor Day, most of the, uh, most of the fishing is done in, uh, in pay lakes. And tourism may also be an option too near your bigger towns and cities. Um, who should do this? I should mention right off the bat, I've worked with fee fishing operations now for probably about 30 years. This is not something everybody could and should do. You've really got to be a, a people person. You've got to be patient with the public. Uh, there's going to be people that are difficult as, as people have a tendency to be in some instances. Um, so it's really not for everybody. Uh, if you're the person that wants to be out on the tractor and left alone, you're probably not the person that wants to run a fee fishing operation. I, I, this is kind of like a general store type situation where, especially in rural areas where everybody kind of knows everybody else, and wants to take the time and the patience to talk to people and, and that sort of thing. So you really have to gear yourself or find somebody who is a, who is a, a good people person to run these things. And management is really the most important aspect of running a fee fishing operation. I wouldn't say the work is particularly difficult, but it is time consuming. The month, the season can run five to eight months, depending where you're located. And uh, it can be long hours during the fishing season and, and you've got to be willing to work weekends or find somebody good to work weekends for you that does a good job. Uh, running a clean and well-maintained facility is really important. Clean bathrooms, this sort of thing. Uh, you want to be able to attract families and that sort of uh, environment and make it, make it really a pleasant uh, experience for folks. Uh, I would think of this in mo most cases, the smaller operations are, are more for supplemental income. 
I've seen a number of retirees that have run these particular operations or somebody that has a job in town, maybe a number, another family member uh, runs a fee fishing operation. But all in all, you've just got to be a good manager. Uh, poor management really can sink one of these operations in a season because people become disgruntled and they just won't come back. Um, but what you need, um, first and foremost, is probably a reliable and affordable source of fish. If you don't have a reliable source of fish, you can get into trouble pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, fee fishing operations, fee fishing operations are stocked pretty much every week, usually Wednesday, Thursday, uh, for the weekend fishing. So they might take on anywhere from 500 pounds of fish or more to, uh, to stock the ponds. Uh, you'll need easy access to the ponds to where uh, accessible parking. So people don't really have to work too hard to get to the, the body of water to fish. And also a concession stand or a building to sell various things such as tackle, bait, sandwiches, uh, just about anything you can think of. I know some that sell quite a bit of fishing gear. Um, you will need a license or a permit, as I mentioned earlier on. It's a good idea to register with the uh, State Fish and Game Department. And typically speaking, a few small ponds, maybe a third to one acre is ideal, as opposed to having one big pond. If the fishing is bad in one pond, people can skip to another. Or if there's a fish kill or some other problem, you can divert traffic from one pond to another instead of just having to deal with, let's say, one larger five or 10 acre pond. And signage with directions is important just because um, a lot of times these places are, are in rural areas and people want to know how to get there. So uh, again, all good management, all good management uh, techniques there. Uh, and this, this is really important. Uh, rule number one is you are selling an entertainment experience. In the first portion of this talk, we were talking about food production or at least selling fish to fee fishing operations. Now you're in the entertainment business. So you really have to try to run a clean facility um, and make the place an enjoyable place for people who want to come, come to fish, come back, maybe tell their friends and relatives that they had a good time there and, and you can build up a customer base. Um, who is catching who? Uh, that's kind of the game here. You really want to catch customers with fish. For those of you that go to the movies, you know, you pay, you pay, now you pay quite a bit of money even to get into the movie but you know where else can you pay eight or ten dollars for a box of popcorn uh, so the, the money is often made on concessions sandwiches tackle this kind of thing you're really trying to entice customers in with the fish and then um, and then you will uh, you will look at uh, trying to sell them added added products uh, like I said food uh, bait work but whatever you have to offer uh, to make a profit. That's where most of the profit comes in. Uh, and got ahead of myself here, but this is what I'm talking about. Other services sold uh, often will, will make, make or break you in terms of profit. You can rent fishing gear for people that may be from out of town or didn't expect to go fishing. I've seen rides, uh, games, all kinds of different alternative activities. Bonus ponds often stocked with either a, a different species of fish or bigger fish. They charge extra to fish those. Uh, some have had restaurants associated with them. Trophy catch and release is, is sort of a bonus pond in a way. Uh, bed and breakfast, I've seen instances of that. And the last one, fish cleaning is a, big, is a big deal. A lot of these operations make money by cleaning fish on site. They'll have the local health department inspect that. You clean, clean the people's fish uh, so that they can take them home and, and eat them. So again, fish sales, for especially some of these little operations, may may not really create much profit. You, you try to hope you hope to break even on the fish, except in very large volume operations, and we don't have too many of those in state to be honest. Uh, small operations, yeah, maybe maybe break even on the sale of fish. Uh, you're going to lose some fish due to mortality, disease, uh, birds, just about anything you can think of. Fish, during, especially during the hot weather, don't do as well and uh, you will lose some fish over the course of the season. Again, fee fishing customers expect to catch fish. So uh, they'd be somewhat disappointed if they come out a few times and don't catch anything. 
again, the season probably March to October would would encompass the entire season. Uh, the, the the fish that you would want to bring to a fee fishing operation, what the the fee fishing owner wants is probably a fish in the one to two pound range. They will they will accept some larger fish. They get pretty grumpy about smaller fish. Nobody wants to catch little tiny fish in the half pound range. But uh, probably one to four pound is the win one to four pounds is what the window they'll accept. Uh, one to two pounds is is ideal. Uh, they might want small deliveries of fish, maybe 500 pounds a week. Uh, typically, they will pay higher prices for fish than processors. So for a small scale producer, that's good news. You might make 25 cents or more per pound selling to a fee fishing operation. And, uh, and it's also a seasonal market, uh, March to December. It is not much fun seining catfish ponds in December and January. So most of our guys are pretty happy to uh, not get involved with that if they don't have to. Uh, this is just a guesstimate. Operations, fee fishing operations might pay $1.35 to $1.75 pound for uh, one to four pound catfish. Uh, this is a picture of a flathead. You don't want that in your ponds. It'll eat your other fish. Um, the way the fish get from the, uh, from, the, from the production ponds to the fee fishing operations is by live haulers. These are independent truckers. Some people haul their own fish, but most of these folks just are middlemen. They, haul, they, they actually buy the fish themselves from the production ponds, and then they sell, resell them to the, uh, to the various uh, fee fishing operations. So they're an integral part of this, uh, of this industry, and some, some producers may haul some fish, and some uh, fee fishing may, operations may haul their own fish, but a lot of these operations are, are independent truck driving operations where uh, they basically load and unload the fish, sell them to the uh, fee fishing operation. So it just depends. Uh, most of our lakes do a general admission fee uh, scheme somewhere $15, $20, let's say, and these are guesstimates with a five to 10 fish limit. They're called ticket lakes. Uh, the very large scale operations, and I don't know that we have too many of these left in state, might charge you $2 or $3 a pound for the catfish uh, you catch, and you can take any amount of fish that you want, you know, 20, 30 pounds, something like that. Uh, we don't have too many of those large scale operations in state right now that I'm aware of. So again, keeping it legal, uh, getting the proper uh, permits from the Fish and Game Department, it's really not difficult at all. It's uh, fairly inexpensive. I think uh, the last time I checked, it was maybe $125 for an annual fee fishing license for the operator to buy to have a registered or permitted lake or, or series of lakes. Uh, if not, you, your customers will have to have a fee fish, uh, will have to have a fishing license uh, issued by the state. And I think fee, fishing licenses now are. 20 or 25 dollars I can't remember I just bought one not too long ago um, so mostly what's offered is is catfish in these operations uh, but there are trout uh, in some instances and in some even carp you know, large carp that people catch don't necessarily bring home but they like to catch big fish so uh, water quality again managed to a lesser degree than the uh, than the uh, feeding on commercial ponds just because the commercial ponds uh, are fed far and away more than the fee fishing uh, bodies of water. Uh, maybe just a little bit of a, a feed added daily just to keep the fish uh, healthy and, and try to keep them free of disease. But water quality is a consideration. In, uh, in these fee fishing ponds, you really have to think of them as holding ponds. They're not really production ponds. So again, just to reiterate, good management is most important. Um, without good management of these operations, they really don't last. But well-managed fee fishing operations, uh, I've, I've worked with some that have been around for you know, decades and uh, people keep coming back. So it's a relatively good and an expensive, uh, mostly ex inexpensive uh, form of entertainment. Let people get out and fish a little bit without a whole lot of expensive equipment and or skill really so it's a, it's a it's a good family uh, 
a good family activity in particular. So this leads us to our last uh, segment. I'll try to field, <clears throat> if time allows, I'll try to field any, uh, any uh, questions on, at the end of this. I don't know how we're doing time-wise or what our limitations are. I'm, uh, I'm maybe running a little bit behind here, but uh, in any event, I will uh, go ahead. Uh, everybody's seen farm ponds, recreational ponds of one sort or another. Uh, we've got them all over Kentucky throughout all portions of the state. Uh, and these are some of the purposes they're built for, livestock, watering, domestic use, fire control, irrigation, recreation, on and on it goes, aquaculture, flood control, you name it. These are just some, some of the uses. So one of the things we have to realize when we, when we start to evaluate a pond for, for fishing purposes is maybe not all these uses are that compatible. Um, so we have to pr prioritize uses and manage the pond accordingly. And if the, the pond allows, or if it's constructed as such, uh, maybe it will provide good fishing. Irrigation ponds, livestock ponds can be difficult to manage for good fishing sometimes, uh, just for water quality reasons. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's kind of a hit or miss. You've got to be able to assess what your pond's being used for, and then, um, and then uh, try and manage it accordingly. Well, let's assume it is good for uh, sport fishing. Probably our best suited uh, sport fishing ponds are at least in half an acre in surface. Uh, we have good water quality, and we'll mention that here in a little bit. Really, you only need a minimum depth of about six to eight feet, if at all possible. I know a lot of our Kentucky ponds are deeper because uh, of the land formation, and there's just no choice but to make them deep. But understanding that you really only need about six feet of water to grow fish. In. The rest is almost a liability. Um, banks and dam free of woody vegetation is good uh, to promote good fishing. And really if we can minimize the depths around the, uh, the shoreline to about, about two and a half feet, and this helps control the growth of aquatic vegetation and filamentous algae, which can snag your hooks and, and not look so good and, and just make fishing in the, in the pond a lot more difficult, particularly from the shoreline. Uh, and a secure location is nice, knowing having some control over who comes in and fishes the body of water. And I've already men mentioned conflicting uses. Not all uses are going to be, pond uses are going to be appropriate to promote good fish. So back to pond construction a little bit, you know, at least 20% clay content to provide uh, good water retention in the clay liner, proper compaction in six inch blankets. It, the, the, the soil ought to, the subsoils ought to ball up in your hand like this, a little ball of clay here uh, that you see up top picture. So that's really what you're looking for. Soil's not too uh, dry, not too, not too wet. You want good compaction. Uh, I don't want to get into this too, too uh, greatly in detail, but this is what a, a cross section of a dam looks like. Uh, you can't just push up a pile of dirt and expect it to hold back water, which you see in the middle of this slide is a core trench. This anchors the trench into the sub, the, uh, the dam into the subsoils and it keeps water from undermining the dam and scooting along the surface of the land where the surface of the land used to be and basically skipping under the dam and blowing it out. So you really need to make sure you build your ponds uh, appropriately, get help from NRCS private excavators, uh, the extension service. I know Jeremy and I, we have all access to these various publications. You really have to know what you're doing when you construct a pond or you can create one, either an ugly hole in the ground or if it's big enough, even a downstream or down valley hazard if the dam were to fail. So you'll want four to one, three to one slopes on the, uh, on the dam uh, to help, to help uh, reduce erosion and you want to get that, those slopes seeded with grasses as soon as possible. You also want to have a good crest of the dam, a good width, so you can drive vehicles back and forth. And you, want, you want slopes that you can manage either you know, by mowing, weed whacking, just whatever, whatever you've got to do uh, to maintain the dam and keep uh, woody vegetation off the dam. You don't want woody vegetation to get established. Trees, bushes get established on a, on a dam. It can, do them structural damage over time. 
Pond seepage is probably the most difficult uh, pond related problem that we get asked to try and solve. Um, leaking ponds can be very difficult to repair, uh, are very expensive and time consuming. And, and in fact, some ponds just can't be repaired. Uh, and a lot of this is due to poor site selection or poor, poor construction methods. So it really pays off to get a good um, trusted excavator, get all the information you can find before you dig a pond or have one uh, sited and uh, find out as much as you can about your, your soils and uh, what you might be getting into. Because nobody wants a hole in their property that doesn't hold water. And you can see one here in the foreground where the pond below is actually doing a pretty good job of holding. These, these were, this was a Pay Lake operation in South Central Kentucky. People ask me about line ponds. You can do it, but they're very expensive. Uh, this liner is very labor intensive and uh, costly on a per square foot basis. It can be done, but I don't generally recommend it. It's, uh, it's, it's prohibitively costly for most people. To establish good fi fishing in a pond, you will want to do a number of things. First, if it's a new pond, you'll want to stock fish in there that you, uh, that you actually want to catch and do well in the pond environment. So that'd be a bluegill and a largemouth bass predator prey relationship. The bluegill spawn a number of times throughout the summer and they will feed the largemouth bass. Uh, in turn, the largemouth bass will keep down the number of bluegill if they're stocked in the right number and are present in the right no number and produce good, good sized bass for fishing, but also keep the bluegill population down enough to where you'll get good bluegill outside of the, uh, in, out of the pond as well. So really, you don't need to feed fish or anything else if the fish are stocked in the appropriate number between bluegill in the upper right and uh, bass on the upper left. Um, you'll have a predator-prey relationship there and they should feed each other. Down below, you'll see red ear sunfish or, or shell crackers and channel catfish. Uh, those species can be added to the pond as well if you want to have those as supplemental species but you, you do want to stock at least the, the bass and the bluegill uh, in most ponds just to get that effective predator-prey relationship. And these, these four species of fish do really well in our small uh, Kentucky ponds. Basically what you want to do is get bluegill that are up over about a quarter pound in size, somewhere around the six, seven inch range, and largemouth bass up over a pound. So these are, these, these are your objectives. That's what you would like to see in your farm pond. Uh, these are just some approximate stocking rates, two to three inches in length. The Fish and Game Department no longer stocks ponds, so people pretty much have to buy fish uh, that they want to stock in their ponds. Out of, out of the fish trucks that come around to feed supply stores and um, these sorts of places, agriculture supply stores, normally they'll haul these fish, uh, stop at these particular dealerships in the, uh, in the spring and the fall of the year. Not so much during the summer as it gets too hot to really effectively haul the fish. But anyway, assuming you've got no fish in the pond, you want to stock about 200 uh, bluegill per acre during the fall. And these are again about two to three inch fish length. Uh, catfish, you can stock some of those optionally if you want, about 50 acre per acre during the fall as well. And largemouth bass, we generally tell people probably about 60 per acre in, in the spring of the year after the bluegill have gotten a chance to spawn uh, in the pond and uh, actually produce some small fish for the small bass to eat. So this is a rough, rough stocking estimates of what you would want to put in a new farm pond on a per acre basis. Uh, many of us inherit ponds and we don't know just what the condition of the fish population is, the fish population is out there. And most of our ponds in state, unfortunately, are underfished. So if you're trying to evaluate a pond, you really need to fish it, fish it pretty hard, get other people there to fish it with you in case you might not be the best fisherman um, and uh, really get an idea of what's going on out there. Sometimes, sometimes there's good fish populations out there. It's just that people haven't paid much attention to them or haven't, uh, you know, haven't been too diligent about fishing. So really, it sounds kind of stupid, but the best way to determine uh, quality fishing is by actually fishing. And, uh, you know, going out there, particularly during the hot days of summer, going out there early morning and at night when the fish 
uh, will, will bite better. So, uh, and with that in mind, uh, these are species of fish you don't want, which is basically everything I mentioned except those four species, uh, golden shiner, crappie, yellow perch, bullheads, any of these fish really uh, will overpopulate in a pond. Uh, so you don't want to stock anything in there other than these species that I mentioned here, which are largemouth bass, bluegill, red ear sunfish or shell crackers, and channel catfish. You can see the forked tail on the channel catfish. You, uh, you, don't, you, don't, want, uh, you don't want a square-tailed cat, catfish, as you see in the lower left, um, in your pond. Uh, flatheads leak your fish, and these little bullheads will grow to two or three inches in length, and they will absolutely reproduce like fruit flies in your pond, and they're very hard to get rid of once you get them in there. So don't encourage those fish uh, species in your pond. Sometimes well-meaning friends and neighbors, uh, family members will stock fish in your pond. But you really want to be a control freak about this. It's a whole lot easier to keep unwanted fish from going into your pond than trying to get them out later on. Uh, this is a pretty good example of a pond I, near my house where I lived in Somerset. I wrote and owned this pond, basically poisoned the entire fish population so they could start anew. But you can see that dollar bill there and the fish in the first two rows are all crappie. And these are probably mature reproducing fish, as are the bluegill on the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, they're all stunted. This is a three-quarter acre pond and I didn't find any largemouth bass in there. So... Uh, this pond just needed to be, this population just needed to be wiped out and start over again, essentially. So if you can keep yourself from doing that, it will uh, save you some trouble um, to get a good fish population established in, in, a, in a farm pond with small fish, a new farm pond. It's probably going to take you about, probably about a year to get decent sized bluegill and maybe 18 months to two years for largemouth bass. And that would probably depend on whether you lived up in the mountains of eastern Kentucky or whether you lived out here in the flatlands of western Kentucky. So it, it, it's a while after uh, to get good fishing in a farm pond if the fish population has to be eliminated and started over again with small fish. Uh, some things you can do to uh, increase fishing success or quality. Uh, people like to feed the fish. You can certainly throw a few pounds of floating feed, catfish uh, feed out there, the bluegill, the catfish. Just about everything else in the world likes uh, fish feed. Largemouth bass generally won't eat it. They'll, they'll eat just pretty much fish. But uh, you can fertilize a pond or add agricultural limestone. I make a lot of recommendations for adding agricultural limestone in ponds to increase the alkalinity and uh, stabilize the pH, especially in our ponds in eastern Kentucky, uh, southern Kentucky, and western Kentucky, uh, the blue gas area generally has pretty uh, high, high pH soils, pretty stable soils and due to all the limestone there, so they don't require agricultural limestone as much. And also, uh, uh, finally, adding aeration uh, is a real good insurance policy to keep your fish alive in the pond uh, if you have access to electricity. And if, on a farm pond, depending on where it's located and how f fertile it is, may, even without fertilization, may produce somewhere between 200 and 400 pounds of fish per acre per year. If you fertilize it, you may be able to uh, get it up even higher than that. I've already mentioned aeration a little bit in terms of uh, fish production. Well, this is, again, just a small aerator in a pond to uh, provide insurance. Uh, to, to provide insurance. And you can see where it's bubbling up there. This provides a little refuge at night in case the uh, dissolved oxygen gets low. Uh, we, um, we recommend these things. They're not cheap by any means. They probably started about $1,000, uh, but they will save your fish population when really nothing else will. You can put them on a timer, uh, and uh, you can, uh, like I said, it's basically an insurance policy for your pond and your, and your fish population. These surface aer aerators are good for, uh, for shallow ponds, probably less, 10 feet or less. Uh, for our deeper ponds, we have diffused aeration devices that basically bubble up aerated water from uh, or aerated water from the uh, bottom of the pond. So, 
wrapping it up here at Pond Management, uh, some things we'd like to avoid, again, during the construction process, and, and also, as ponds age, they tend to get shallow areas around the edges where aquatic plants and algae tend to thrive. So trying to at least initially avoid shallow areas, two and a half feet or less around the edges will help uh, control some of the aquatic plant issues. Uh, again, where you can do it, keep depths uh, 10 feet or less is fine for growing fish. I understand that we've got tons of ponds that are 15, 20, 30 feet deep. Uh, because of the, uh, the, the contour of the land. But just to understand that really to grow fish, all you need is about six to eight feet of water, really. You don't need much uh, in terms of depth. I don't generally encourage uh, structure, submerged structure in ponds, uh, unless it's greater than two acres. Uh, if you do put something out there, uh, like Christmas trees, cedar trees, uh, just weight them down and put a buoy on there so you can take them out. Uh, should you want to uh, re remove them for some reason. Uh, don't put big structures out there that you have to live with because you can't haul them out with anything short of a crane. Uh, spawning containers generally don't work too well for catfish in ponds because largemouth bass come along and eat the young. Uh, bait bucket introductions from other ponds or usually, or from bait shops, uh, fish from other ponds, any of that stuff is just a bad idea. You want to be a control freak about about your pond. Uh, excessive nutrient loading uh, from pastures, agriculture, crops, and septic, anything you can think of. Try to control the, the nutrients in there and that'll go a long way to helping you uh, control vegetation problems in your pond. Uh, don't over harvest the bass, over or under har harvest the bass. An under harvested bass population will eventually result in about a bunch of eight to 10 inch bass and there'll be too many of them. If you over harvest it, you'll just have a stunted bluegill population. So you want to hit that middle ground where you harvest a few bass a year, but not too many. And when the fish start to get too small, the bass start to get too small, you're going to need to take some more out. And finally, don't apply pond algicides or herbicides during real, real hot weather, at least in anything other than spot treatments. You really don't want to get in there and do a whole pond treatment for fear of depleting the oxygen during the hot days of summer. And on a positive note, uh, the things you want to do is fish the pond. Uh, you want to probably try to keep some, keep some catch records, what you put in and take out of the pond. You'll make for more efficient management. Again, manage the vegetation and water quality and control fishing access. Uh, I, I know I have fished a pond where a friend lets a friend in and a neighbor lets a neighbor in, and pretty soon half the town is fishing a one acre pond. So it, it, people leave garbage around, it's, it's just not a, it's not a good thing when it gets away from your control. Um, control shoreline vegetation. Willow trees are notorious for growing on dams and around the pond edges. A little of that is nice, but try to keep the woody stuff off the dams. And check the pond throughout the year. There's actually quite a bit going on out there during the winter and people miss it because uh, uh, they're not interacting with their pond as much, but uh, it, it's important to check it around the year. Think of it kind of like a garden spot or something that at least takes looking in on uh, throughout the year. And lastly, make it a nice uh, environment and enjoyable place to be around. Keep it well maintained so that you can really enjoy it. That's pretty much what I have. Uh, we're just about at an hour. Uh, down below in the red, you can see my, uh, my website link. I have uh, any number of publications on aquaculture of all kinds and pond and lake management, and even some on fee fishing, some other topics. So with that, um, like I said, we're just about at an hour here. Uh, people are probably getting hungry if they haven't eaten dinner yet. So uh, Jeremy, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Forrest, great stuff. Thank you so much. Great information there uh, uh, on, on all three of those topics, uh, which kind of all blended together. Does anybody have any questions? First, I have a question, uh, yes, maybe sir. a question slash comment, but mm -hmm. I, I lived in Pike County, Kentucky, then Floyd County, Kentucky for a while, and it seemed like there was a, a pay lake and every other holler had a had a pay lake. And, yeah. And you move outside of that, and you just don't, uh, like I'm over here in Wise, Virginia now, not that far away, and I mm -hmm. don't know of any in the county. Right. I don't know. I never could explain that, why it's so popular. Is it a cultural thing? Is it 
Does it have to do with local regulations? Um, what do you have a good? I, you know, I, I really don't know the answer to that either. I, I, I worked in North Carolina before I came to Kentucky. We had a few pay lakes, but we certainly didn't have any any of the number like uh, we, we have in state here. And we've estimated, and they're really hard to keep track of, but we've estimated that between registered pay lakes and non-registered ones, we might have 100 operations throughout the state. Okay. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. We don't have very many of them. In Western Kentucky, when I first started working here in the 90s, there was a couple big operations out here, but they have pretty much closed and no one really took them over. So there's not really, uh, once you get, well, once you get west of uh, um, I-65, the numbers really start to diminish in terms of operations. There's quite a few up around Jefferson County and Louisville area. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of them small ones out in eastern Kentucky. Uh, I, I, I don't really have an explanation for it either. Okay. A lot of people jump into it thinking it's just a matter of throwing some fish in a body of water and it's easy money. Right. And, that, and, and a lot of those just, unless they're run properly, don't, don't succeed very well. Because it is a lot of people management. It's long hours, uh, especially during the season. But there's been a number of people that have really, you know, made them quite successful just because they went went out of their way to keep a clean operation and manage them well. Right. So uh, it's an interesting business to study. I've never, yeah. never really figured out a lot of it myself, and I've been at it for some time. <laughs> right. 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 Thank you. Blair Lake uh, that was here in, here in Letcher County, in Part or here in, you know, in Partridge, Letcher County, just across the line from Harlan County, was extremely successful for years. They had a couple of lakes there and uh, right. basically it was every Friday and Saturday nights. And then, that, you know, they would have a, you know, big fish payout, that sort of thing. And so, uh, you know, it was one of those things of people were going with the car loads. Uh, so it was something right. that, uh, that you saw. Um, I know Laurel County, uh, you know, on 229 between Barville and, uh, and London, you know, Knox and Laurel County there, uh, there are several. There's probably three or four, it seems like. Yeah, and there was a time where there was many. Yeah, many more than that, I think. I was to many of them out there. Uh, and then, like, uh, on trout, I don't hear a lot of trout. Uh, there used to be one uh, in Tazewell, Tennessee, just south of uh, Middlesbrough, uh, Kentucky. There, uh, I know there used to be one down there. I know there was one over around Rural Retreat, Virginia, because uh, uh, back in the day, I can remember uh, when I worked at Southeast, we bought fish off the guy. Matter of fact, he even sold fish to him, but he had a uh, interesting fee fishing uh, enterprise over there with trout. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and we, we did some work with them early on and, and with trout, and, and, you know, the response was pretty good. The problem with trout is, is really once you start getting around – Probably you'd probably be okay in, in eastern Kentucky through April, but it's a little iffy weather-wise. Once that weather, once that water temperature starts getting up around 70 degrees, you start losing the fish. So you, you you're really depending on people probably to get out there in March and April to fish. And a lot of folks just don't associate fishing with those colder temperatures, uh, you know, in our warm water lakes. Now, if you had a, and I've seen them, especially around the Mammoth Cave very, you know, basically spring fed ponds that stay cold year round. And some of those you could probably stock with trout, trout year round and, and, uh, and, and fish them. Uh, one of the problems we found with growing trout for food is that Kentuckians don't really eat a lot of trout. Well, you found that out too, probably. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not the, it's not the fish of choice, generally speaking. You know, a lot of people from out of state like them, the Midwest. Uh, in fact, a lot of the folks that grow trout here, uh, have them live hauled up to the, you know, the Midwest where they sell them. So uh, just not, you know, the sportsmen, yeah, they'll go out and fish for trout, but the average Kentuckian would probably rather eat crappie or a catfish than a trout. Some of us have found that out uh, in, in difficult ways. <laughs> I, I think the two places that I had mentioned on the trout, I think they were so successful was because it was a flow through and they had, they were spring fed and sure. so it was, it was, you know, cold water all the times. And so there were a, uh, a it was a flow, th flow through. Right. Uh, Woody asked a good question here. Is there a directory of pay lakes in Kentucky? 
I know there used to be a directory of, uh, of uh, I guess you could say, places where you purchase fish, but is there a directory, directory on pay lakes that you know of for us? Well, that, that's a really good question, and, and we, have been, we have been working towards that end. Uh, pay lakes have been amazingly difficult to keep up with, and what we have found is the operations uh, tend to come and go. Um, some of them are re aren't re registered, so we'd have no way of knowing them. About the only way we can find out about them is through word of mouth, um, through word of mouth, and or uh, through uh, opened records uh, with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Resources. Uh, I've been trying to keep up with them for years, and 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 really haven't gotten too terribly far with it. I'm, one of the things we could do, and if we got some good cooperation, if we could basically ask the county agents, county by county, to report the operations they have in, in their county, uh, you know, whether you have one or two or four or whatever, uh, that would probably be our best shot at, at getting a good record of these things. But to, to answer Woody's question, you know, we really, we've really been remiss in trying to keep up with that. It's been a, a cat herding exercise, uh, you know, going, going into a probably a, a county and asking people what pay lakes are around in the area is still probably better than asking one of us. We still have, we tend to keep track of some of the longer standing established operations, but they pop up here and there and they disappear. And also what they do is some operations are taken over by other people. So they're in a different name. They're leased out. Uh, keeping up with them has been a, a bigger job than I would have ever answered. Dissipated. So we don't really have a very good directory right now. You know, if we could maybe some, when it slows down in the winter sometime, maybe just ask the, uh, particularly the agents in the eastern and central part of the state, if they could send us a, a list of operations, that might really give us our best shot at trying to uh, make some sort of directory. It'd be nice to have if we could do it. If we I don't know how else to do it otherwise. Uh, no, that 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 gives a that's a that's a good synopsis there. Uh, I know uh, early in your uh, presentation you had a sign there, a uh, photo of a sign there, Four Star Village there in Knott County, right. and right. I recently heard that uh, that it was no longer uh, uh, in business, uh, that it had been sold out, and that uh, that was a very successful operation there. So uh, there in Knott County. Yeah, I I actually helped them get started with that little pay lake they had up there. The last Last I heard, and I wouldn't want, Charles and I went up there, oh, it was a few years ago, but anyway, um, they had sold it into like an events place. They've got an events barn up on top of the hill uh, where they would do weddings and family reunions and those sorts of things. And and the last I heard of it, you know, when when they had those events, they let people come down and fish the lake as part of that whole, whole package. Now, uh, Jimmy and Regina might have gotten tired of running it and sold it. The whole operation. I'm not. I'm not up up on the day to day uh, aspect of these things. But no, they did run a good operation. They had a catering business. Uh, they really diversified up there. They they tried a little bit of everything. But the last I saw was a, a pretty good size events barn. And those we've got any number of those things out, out here. So I'm, I'm sure you've got them where you live as well. Yeah, it's very very successful. And you know that's one of the things that I've seen with some of these pay lights are. They're very successful. And then I've seen some that were just placed on the side of the road and they've done fairly well. So that's kind of like the ones that I've seen there in Laurel County. Uh, they seem to be uh, yeah. pretty good uh, operations. And, uh, you know, some some have actually, some of the lakes have been built within the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's something that I think is really going to last out out there. And, you know, I've, I've, I've discussed Pay lakes with you know folks in North Carolina, Texas, and Georgia probably have more. Uh, I think Kentucky has more than anybody, uh, but Texas and Georgia has some. Uh, maybe bigger operations that I'm not too sure of, but uh, you know for whatever reason this seems to be this seems to be the the hub for at least numbers of operations from what I can tell. Uh, it's it's an interesting business, and I'm not sure I. After studying it for 30 years, I have a lot of the answers, but I, I've been around it anyway. <laughs> so, I understand. Well, good stuff, great information. Anybody else have any other questions before we wrap up this evening? 
Forrest, it's, it's been great. Uh, good to see you. Uh, well, good to see you, Jeremy and Phil. I've enjoyed it. Um, thanks, thanks, Forrest. My, I don't know if you all have any kind of uh, electric sign-in sheet or anything, but one of my administrators asked me for that the other day. I don't even know what he's talking about, but if you, if you have anything like that and you wouldn't mind emailing it to me, that'd be great. If not, don't worry about it. We don't really have anything. Uh, I can send you how many people that we have on tonight. I think we have about 11 on tonight. So uh, that's that'll work for me. I yeah. mean, you know, these folks, they always come up with new and different things. I mean, uh, how do you sign in electrically, uh, electronically to a Zoom meeting? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, great, great information. We really, really appreciate you coming on. And it looks like you're getting a lot of kudo, kudos on here. But uh, uh phil before we wrap things up uh you want to cover a little bit of the, about the next two weeks i know we had looked about taking off the week of the 24th and mm -hmm. then we had to ch make a change on some uh, on a speaker so uh we're right. going to be we're going to have one on the 18th and then one on the 27th and yeah. then we'll get back to our two a week uh, starting in september so on the 18th you want to talk about truffles uh, yes, that's coming up Tuesday at 6 o'clock, uh, the 18th. We've got Dr. Janine Davis from North Carolina State University. She's going to be talking about truffles in the southeast. And she told me that one of the largest uh, truffle producers is, is near Bowling Green, Kentucky, one of the largest truffle producers in the U.S. Uh, they've done some work. We have a person in Wise County who's in the process of installing some uh, commercial uh, hazelnuts. And that's that's one of the species that they – inoculate the roots with for the truffles and they're also using some oak species so she's going to talk about that process and the, the way the market looks so that that should be uh, pretty interesting sounds good and then we'll be off on thursday we won't have anything on thursday of next week uh the following week we won't have anything on tuesday uh but we will have uh on thursday the 27th uh we will have uh, a beekeeping and winter preparation uh so that uh uh, that should be a good one. And then we'll get back to our Tuesday, Tuesday, Thursday gig, uh, starting on September one. So, uh, good to see everybody this evening. Uh, Forrest, thank you again. Oh, thank you all for hosting me. But, uh, we'll see everybody, I guess, uh, next Tuesday evening then. All right. Everybody have a good night. Oh, you too. Y'all well. have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.